Okay, great. Um, then um, uh, it's a pleasure for me to uh, to introduce our uh, second speaker, um, Paul Bergner. Um, he has a, a background in uh, psychology and uh, mathematics. Originally um, studied um, in uh, in Münster, where he also uh, did his uh, PhD, and where he also started uh, working on. Um, uh, this package that we will uh, hear something about um, today, uh, BRMS for uh, Bayesian reg regression modeling strategies. And um, he was um, an early adopter um, for, of um, the uh, very powerful STAN um, MCMC infrastructure and um, uh, was, uh, had realized the, the need um, to, to give people um, um, an accessible uh, interface for certain kinds of, uh, of models and uh, started with, um, I, I think, um, multi-level modeling um, uh, was um, so uh, GLMs and GLMMs and extensions thereof were the, the first uh, motivation, at, at least there was where I came, became aware of the package. Um, and uh, then it grew from there and um, became a very uh, powerful package uh, and a popular package for doing all sorts of uh, Bayesian um, regression modeling in um, uh, leveraging the STAN infrastructure. And um, today we will um, uh, hear about uh, one specific uh, family of models uh, that uh, can also be fitted uh, with BRMS and that, uh, that are um, particularly uh, of interest uh, to the audience of this workshop, um, the uh, Psychogo Psychometric Computing Workshop, um, namely uh, Bayesian uh, item response modeling. And uh, I think Paul will show, show us how some classical models and also extensions thereof uh, nicely fit into this uh, BRMS uh, framework of this. Um, so I'm looking uh, forward to this exciting talk. Um, Paul, the floor is yours. Thank you. And thank you very much for inviting me. And uh, yeah, it's a pleasure to be here. So today I will talk about kind of Bayesian item response modeling, um, and then also show a little bit about the BRMS interface and how we can do that. Um, so it's, it's based on a paper that is accepted in Journal of Statistical Software. They told me, I don't know, seven months ago that it would probably take a year until it's published. So it's going to be accepted or in, in press for some time, but you can find it on, on archive if you want to read it. It's quite long uh, paper. So um, let's think about item response theory, IRT models kind of in a nutshell. So what are we needing for for IRT models. So we need a set of parameters, uh, chi, i for um, the items. So we need some item parameters. We need some um, person parameters. Um, and basically what we want to do in IRT, we want to learn something about our items. We want to learn something about our people. And we do that through our responses y. So basically the response yip, that is the response um, of person P on item I um, is kind of modeled using some model um, based on the item parameters and on the person parameters. Um, usually we can like write it up that way, um, but then we need to add some restrictions to the whole parameter vector of all item and of all person parameters, um, because if we don't, then the model is in classical terms um, spoken like not identified in the sense that the model is a little bit too complex, so we need to add some restrictions. For instance, we could say that um, the person parameters overall people should sum to zero um, so that kind of the scale is identified. Um, and now we can do make that in a, in a Bayesian manner, write that down, and it basically stays the same, um, except that now the restrictions on our parameters are expressed as prior, so just the last part changes in the sense that we have some um, priors on or prior distributions on the item parameters and we have some, here we have some other um, prior distributions on the person parameters. So for those of you who are not familiar with Bayesian statistics or prior distributions, our prior distributions are basically probability distributions, but we don't set them on the data, but on the parameters. That is our priors 
could, for example, contain some prior knowledge about our parameters that doesn't come from data, but comes from other sources. So we can use that information and put it into the prior in some sensible form and uh, to inform also our model estimates of person and item parameters. But like independently of like prior knowledge, we can also use um, those prior distributions for the usual kind of stuff that we use in IRT models for identification. For example, we could specify um, certain kinds of normal priors that I'm, I'm going to discuss in a second to kind of identify the, the scale of our person parameters with a soft sum to zero constraint, much like uh, we do for classical uh, IRT models um, as well. And just that we think of those restrictions in Bayesian IRT context in terms of those prior distributions on the parameters. And one important aspect of, of this specification is that usually, at least I haven't seen much else applications, we specify priors on person and on item parameters independently. That is usually we don't specify joint priors jointly between item and person parameters, but I'm sure there would also be applications of that. Um, so let's write those IRT models in terms of regression models uh, in order to like fit those models in, in BRMS. So we consider the data to be in long format, that is kind of all responses of all items responded by, uh, to, to, by all um, people in one long um, column, every response of every item of every person under each other, um, and call that whole vector just y. Uh, and then consider that there's kind of a, a likelihood distribution, there's a distribution of the data that has some, what I call distribution of parameters. C1 to C K. So to fill that with a little bit more life, suppose um, our likelihood was a normal distribution, then the normal distribution has two parameters, there's a mean parameter, which we usually call a mu or something like that, and it has a standard deviation parameter sigma. So basically here, like um, in, in order to, to frame IRT models in this context, we had this long format of data with a likelihood, and then we had those distribution of parameters, for instance, mu and sigma. Uh, if the likelihood was normal. Um, and to make this actually a regression model, um, we now kind of connect the distributional parameters, those um, psi, to the item and person parameters via some response function. We could also call it the inverse link function, right? So the response function is just the inverse of the link function. So every of these parameters can potentially be predicted by some combination of item and person parameters. So what makes this, this special in a way is that we no longer only um, predict the main, usually kind of a mean parameter um, of the likelihood, but we can potentially, if we want to um, predict using regression models, using item and person parameters, all of those distributional parameters, not just the main parameter, which makes this kind of a little bit more flexible. And um, BRMS has evolved to also support these kinds of complex distributional models so hence we leverage that to make IRT modeling a little bit more flexible. Um, but let's start simple and look at like some simple classical IRT models, how we can um, frame them in, in this kind of framework. Um, let's look at some binary responses. So in, in when, when our data, our responses are binary, uh, we use where we assume basically the, Bernoulli, the Bernoulli distribution is likelihood which has just a single distribution of parameter, right? So no, not multiple parameters, just one of them. And um, when we kind of write down the model like that, of course, we couldn't write down the classical binary IRT models like the Rush model, where basically our success probability or the, the probability of, of having a correct response is, is a function of uh, the sum of kind of a difficulty parameter of the items and a, an ability parameter. Um, of the person, or if it's the sum, we can also say the, the item parameter is the easiness. And F could be chosen however we like, as long as the resulting um, predictions are in the unit interval that is between zero and one, because the parameter we are predicting is a probability, so needs to be between zero and one. One example could be we could use the logistic function or the inverse log it link, basically. And to achieve that, but other choices are possible and can be written down in the framework and also in BRMS. Um, we can then go on from there and um, define the two PL model where we add some discrimination parameter um, to account for the fact that not all um, items are measuring um, 
kind of a person parameters in all of the, the person parameter traits um, in the same way. So we could add this alpha i uh, and multiply it by, by the sum of person and, and easiness parameter. Um, or we could have a 3PL model where we um, take into account that, it, that in some cases it's possible to get the right um, answer by guessing. So we have a guessing parameter, which are called gamma here, that could also be varying across item, hence the index i. So basically when we write it down like that with a, a Bernoulli response and some dist one distribution parameter, we could write down those classical models as a very special case um, of that framework. Um, so now we are doing it in a Bayesian manner. So we have the ability to think about prior distributions. And the main distinction that I want to make here between different priors is whether the prior is hierarchical um, or whether it is non-hierarchical. So in a non-hierarchical pr um, prior specification, we basically specify independent prior distribution for each parameter. In this case, here in this example, for the item parameters. So if we write that each item parameter for each item i is normally distributed with mean zero and standard deviation three, this is what we would a priori expect the item parameters to be. And if we uh, kind of think of a, of, a, of a latent log it scale as in our Bernoulli example, a normal prior with mean zero and standard deviation three would probably be rather weakly informative because of the scale of that, that log it scale, it would unlikely be much larger than let's say minus five or five or something like that. So the normal prior just make sure um, we are a priori already staying in a plausible range, thus excluding or like making less likely um, highly Im implausible values a priori. Um, so we could do that, or we could also use a hierarchical prior specification. That is, we would say our each individual item parameters is normally distributed with mean zero and some standard deviation um, sigma belonging to the items, but the sigma wouldn't be fixed as in the initial um, example, but it would again be a parameter of the model in terms of a random effects um, model if we want to, a multi-level model if we want to. Um, and we could then also specify a prior on that standard deviation. For instance, we could say it's a truncated normal with, with kind of mean parameter zero and standard deviation parameter one, or we could say it's a half normal prior. Of course, we could also use other distributions. The essential part here is that through this hierarchy of parameters, through this sharing of one standard deviation parameter over all the item parameters, we define a joint prior over all of these item parameters rather than independent priors. Um, so we could extend that if we not ha have only one item parameter per item, but multiple ones, for instance, in, in difficulty parameter and a discrimination parameter, then we could say this vector of K, let's say item parameters um, is multivariate normal distributed with mean zero and some, some covariance metrics. And then we would kind of um, decompose that covariance matrix into a correlation matrix and some standard deviation, some standard deviations. We can always do that. The notation doesn't matter much. It's, it's more like that. I have trouble thinking of covariance matrices, but I, but I think I understand roughly what correlation matrices are and what standard deviations are. So I'm specifying priors on what I understand, standard deviations and correlations or correlation matrices. Um, and then I'm putting that together to define um, the covariance matrix. Um, and so the standard deviations could again be truncated normal. And for the correlation um, matrix, we could, for example, use the so-called LKJ prior. Um, it's a very nice prior. It has, has been written by three authors with very complicated names and they, the initials are L, K, and J. So hence, um, some people came up with that name. Um, the, the first name is Lewandowski, the other ones I, I've, I've forgotten. But it's a very nice prior on correlation matrices that in short avoids a lot of problems we usually have with, with Wishart or inverse Wishart distribution, which we usually would use for covariances or correlation matrices. So in STAN and also in BRMS, we strongly advocate using this LKJ prior, which has one parameter basically um, telling how concentrated the correlation matrix is around the zero correlation matrix. If this shape parameter is one, um, the, the prior is uniform across all possible correlation matrices of that respective dimension. Okay, so how, how are we going to fit those models? Um, so um, 
basically the, the talk will, will be showing code from, from my BRMSR package, which behind the scenes takes your input that I'm going to show and writes the STAN code. So for, for those of you who have not heard about STAN, STAN is a probabilistic programming language. It's the programming language um, as R, as Python, but focusing on writing down potentially very complex Bayesian models and also estimating them using powerful samplers. STAN itself is written in C++, but it had its own language, which kind of is a mix of, of R and C++. And I very much like the language, but of course it takes a long time kind of to, to write every of, of your specific models in STAN directly, and it's more error prone. So if there's a higher level package, for example, BRMS, but also others that supports already your model and just uses STAN behind the scenes, I recommend using those because that's usually easier and, and a time saver, so to speak. Um, so how, how do we specify our models? First of all, we need to decide what kind of model family we are assuming. Well, family just means what kind of likelihood we, we are having. I don't know why, uh, who and why people in R came up with the word family for the likelihood distribution, but I use that as well in BRMS. So as a family, we would say, okay, it's a BRMS family to be supported in, in BRMS. We would specify the name of the family, for instance, Gaussian or Bernoulli or Poisson. We would specify the link function. Um, and if that family has more distributional parameters, not just one, we would we could potentially um, specify more link arguments to also specify the link functions for the additional distributional parameters. So in the binary model, this looks quite simple. So the family is Bernoulli and the link is logit, while logit would also be the default if we didn't specify it. Um, for the Gaussian model, it, it looks a little bit more complicated if we want to. So the family is Gaussian, the link is identity for the main mean parameter. Um, and then we have this additional um, standard deviation parameter sigma. So we could also specify link on sigma if we wanted to, um, which only takes effect if we're actually predicting sigma. If we leave it constant across all observations, this link is ignored. So then we have the model formula, which um, is basically just extended LME4 formula. So for those of you who have been working with LME4 or similar packages, will or should ho hopefully have an easier start with BRMS because the syntax is exactly the same. Um, so if we want to have item parameters to have independent priors or just completely flat priors, if we want to, and person parameters to have a hierarchical prior, um, we could specify it as follows. So, so why our, um, our responses are predicted by zero plus item, which basically removes the intercept and makes sure items are cell mean coded so that every item uh, gets its own parameter. And then we specify a, a random intercept for person. So basically one single, um, one single person parameter per person. Um, and then this hierarchical prior, which is implicit in this random effects notation that is the same as an LME4. We could, of course, also specify both item and person parameters using hierarchical priors, which then would like this so look like this. So we had a random effect across items and we would have, and have a random effect across persons. Um, personally, I don't see a specific reason why items should be fixed and persons should be random. I know there are arguments for that. So I usually um, go for just having both as, as random effects, but that's, that's more like a personal preference. And I know there are other good arguments against that. Um, independent of that choice, we can add covariates. So if, if there are some, some other variables which we want to include in our IRT model, we could add that. For example, if we had a covariate X, we could just like write it down in the fixed effects part of the model, or we could also write it down in terms of varying effects of item and of persons, and I'm going to show that in a minute. Um, we can make this more complex now. So I spoke about distribution models at the start, which didn't just have one parameter, one distribution parameter, but multiple ones, for example, three. So then we had potentially, if we wanted to, three of those formulas. So the first formula where we specify the response on the left-hand side is always for the main parameter, which is usually the mean or some other central parameter, some, some parameter of central tendency. But if we have other distribution parameters, such as the standard deviation sigma or the, or the normal distribution, we can also specify formulas for that. So here we had three parameters, one main and two kind of auxiliary distribution parameters, all with um, hierarchical priors on items and on persons separately. Um, what we can also do, and we're going to need that in a second, is we can specify nonlinear 
um, formula, so nonlinear predictor terms, because it turns out even kind of simple IRT models like the 2PL model cannot be written down in a, in a linear formula because we have this multiplication of um, parameters. Um, so we need some other syntax to, to, um, to use and to specify such thing in, in, um, in BRMS or in general in regression models. So we say uh, y is, is predicted by a fun, so some function we have defined um, based on, for example, predictor um, variable x and two nonlinear parameters, nl power one and nl power two. And then again, we would specify linear formulas for that first and for that second nonlinear parameter. And to make sure that BRMS knows this first central formula, y predicted by fun, et cetera, is, um, is not to be evaluated using classical R formula syntax parsing, but actually taken literally in some way. Um, we said NL to two, so then NL for nonlinear, so that the first will be recognized as nonlinear formula and treated differently. Um, kind of a, a disadvantage of that syntax here is that if we specify like this, those different item parameters for the different distributional or nonlinear parameters are considered independent of each other. That is the um, main item parameter on the, the main parameter um, it will be modeled as independent um, of the item parameters on part two or part three in the first example. Um, of course, usually we would like to model them as correlated in order to allow those parameters to share information with each other across those different parts of the model. And I had an idea for a syntax at the start. I thought it was nice and I confused people, so I'm not sure how nice it is. But what we basically do is instead of having one of these vertical dashes, we have two, and then in between those dashes, we, um, we write a symbol or multiple symbols. It doesn't matter what you write there. It's just important that it is shared across those different terms you want to model as correlated. That is, we, in the first example, we have three item random effects for the three distribution parameters. We want them to model as correlated, so we write the symbol i below, uh, be, between each of those dashes, and, and BRMS will recognize that and model them as correlated, same with the persons. Literally, it doesn't matter what you write there. You could write kind of fitting IRT models in Bayesian statistics takes so much time and it would work as long as it's the same uh, for all of those uh, terms. Please don't try to correlate item and person random effects with each other because that's not going to work because there's no match and BRMS will complain. So only correlate item parameters with, with each other in the same with person parameters. Um, so let's um, look at a simple example. Um, the Verbeck data set, um, it's one of the classical um, data sets in, in LME4. It's about um, how people kind of use or want to use verbal aggression depending on, on different kind of context. Um, and we could specify, for example, the classical rush model with random effects on item and on person parameters, the ID is here, the person parameter. And R2 is, is a dichotomous response and whether you kind of engage in that kind of verbal aggressive behavior or not. We could specify some priors. For instance, um, we could specify a truncated normal zero three prior on the standard deviation class, which is the standard deviation of the um, person of the um, of the random effect parameters based on for, for both the group ID and for the group um, item. Um, BRMS instead knows that this is a standard deviation, so it's not going to be a real normal zero three prior, but it's going to be automatically truncated at zero. So then we put this formula, we put the prior, the data set, um, and the family, in this case Bernoulli log it together in a model, uh, and we have our rush model in a much more complicated way than usual. Uh, estimate. Um, then we can, can look at some output. For example, on the left, we could see the marginal posterior distributions. And on the right, we would see how the, the different Markov chains, the MCMC chains, basically estimate those parameters, which is not the focus of this talk. So I'm going to skip that a little bit quicker. Um, of course, we can also then kind of um, plot um, our person and our item parameters, in this case, the item parameters. Uh, on the x-axis, we see the estimate. Uh, on the y-axis, we see the item number. We have 24 items. And the, the um, black bars are basically our 95% credible intervals, which we can easily compute from quantiles of the posterior distribution and our 
black dots are um, our posterior mean estimates, which is kind of the Bayesian point estimate, if you will. Um, now it can get a little bit more complicated. For example, if we are specifying a 2PL model, remember it's not longer a linear model, we have to use some nonlinear syntax. So we're starting by saying R2, it will be a nonlinear formula, is exponential of some, some log alpha, some log discrimination times eta, while eta is again our, our item and person thing with kind of item parameters, in this case, easiness parameters and some person parameters, while the, the log discrimination will only be predicted or only be depending on the items because the log discrimination is a, should be like an item parameter, not person parameter. So eta is both item and person parameter or predicted by them, while alpha is only predicted by the items. And to make sure um, our discrimination will in the end be positive so that we don't run into non-identification problem. We model the, the alpha on the log scale, hence predicting log alpha and then exponentiating it in the nonlinear formula to make sure discrimination itself is positive. Then we could specify a bunch of priors. And um, yes, I've seen that, thanks. And um, the most important thing here is that we um, set a constant um, prior on the standard deviation of the, the ID part of the person parameters, because otherwise the, the standard deviation of the person parameters and the discriminations are not identified because, um, or basically their scales are not identified because if we increase one, the other decreases. So we need to fix one in order to make model fitting easier. In this case, we're just fixing the standard deviation of the, um, of the person parameters to one using this constant one argument. And then again, we fit the model. We could compare the two models. Um, in this case, we would see that basically it doesn't make much of a difference if we use um, some, some leave one or cross validation approach. And so for example, we could continue going with the kind of simple um, one PL model. Um, I'm skipping the, the, um, the example where we could add covariates um, and just one to for the last two minutes want to show you some more complex example because I, I bet you didn't come for this talk just to see how one and two PL models can be estimated because I assume you can already do that using your favorite R package. Um, so here we're using the rotation data set which is about how quickly people can mentally rotate one figure against each other in their mind to determine whether after rotation there's the same figure or not. Um, and we are recording the response times this is the time and we are um, we are recording the, the RESP, the response uh, zero or one. So whether they are judging correctly, whether they are the same or incorrectly and rotate would be the degree of rotation against each other. Um, and we can, can model that for example, using Wiener drift diffusion models, um, which is basically a cognitive model with three or four parameters that models different aspects of the cognitive process. Um, in such data. And the Wiener Drift Diffusion model is a family implemented in BRMS with those multiple parameters, which we can all predict using item and person parameters. Um, so, so we could fit that model in BRMS using the distributional regression framework. We could specify the main parameter, which is the um, so-called drift rate. So whether we are people drifting towards the right or, or the incorrect response, we specify the response variable in two parts. First, the response time, and then we are adding additional information on the decision. So whether they um, made a correct or an incorrect response, we're going to pre um, predict that using this rotate information. So how much, um, how much the, the, the two figures were rotated against each other. And we are modeling that with person and of item parameters, but we, not, we don't stop there, but we also model the boundary separation and non-decision time, which are two um, other dis sorry, um, two other distribution parameters of that Wiener distribution model. We're also modeling that using person and item parameters. And the, the bias parameter, which is the fourth parameter of that model, we set to, to 0 0.5. So we're fixing it to assume that there's zero bias and zero bias in this model is 0 0.5. We can fit that model in BRMS. And we can look at some results. So where, for example, we see in kind of three plots, each for one, one of the model's distribution of parameters. So on the left-hand side, we see that the, the, the drift rate, it's much 
slower for higher rotation. That is, people are drifting slower to the to the correct or incorrect response, depending on how they how much the figures are rotated. And the non-decision time on the very right is increased for higher rotation. That is, people need more time to process um, those figures, rotating them against each other before they can make any decision or initiate any decision process. Okay. That's it. If you want to learn more about BRMS and STEN, um, you can install BRMS in, in R. It's, it's on CRAN. You could look at the help pages, look at some vignettes. Um, there's also a website for BRMS and STEN. You can contact me, write me, write me an email, or you can, can tag me on Twitter if you like. Thank you very much for your attention. Thanks very much, Paul, for this exciting talk.